I have ridden it at 50 miles an hour. I've ridden behind it at 50 miles an hour. Um, that's a reasonable speed for that locomotive. That's, you don't want to beat the locomotive because it's an old piece of equipment. A steam locomotive is essentially a reciprocating machine, a very large reciprocating machine. Once you pull it, put it together and start operating it, it wants to pull itself apart. On a trip you have to have, you have to be certain you have enough fuel in the tender. On the 700, that's about 6,000 gallons. And then uh, you also have to have enough water, and that's around 20,000 gallons. And uh, so the rate of consumption of the fuel versus the water is you're consuming about a gallon of fuel for every 10 gallons of water. So the water is consumed at a faster rate, and you have to refill the tender with water more frequently. Uh, the rule of thumb in the railroads on the mainline runs was about every 100 miles you tried to make sure that the tank was filled. It's not good to put cold water into the boiler. It's very hard on the boiler. There's a feed water heater. There's a pump back under the cab that runs water up through this pipe into this box. And then when steam exhausts out of a cylinder, it comes through these big pipes, goes through the water to heat it, and then it goes back out and is exhausted. This is a pump down here. So once the water is heated, it goes down to this pump, and this pump then drives it up in through a thing called a check valve into the boiler. The fire is built back in the firebox, and the smoke and the heat come through the flue tubes, and in that process, the heats the water, which goes up to the steam dome. The smoke will come out here go up through the petticoat and out the smokestack. The water that is heated goes up to the steam dome. From the steam dome, it comes back down and recirculates through the superheater tube. At this point, the water is 300 degrees, and after it goes through the superheater tube, it heats to 800 degrees. The steam path into the cylinder comes down this way. You can see the bulge in the casting comes and it's delivered first into the valve. This is the valve inside here. This is the cylinder right here. And they work together. It's a double acting piston. And what that means is the steam pushes both sides as it's admitted and exhausted like this. And that's how you get the chuff, chuff, chuff sound. So after the steam is superheated, the throttle then admits that superheated steam into the delivery pipe where it comes into the valve and thence the cylinder. So the throttle up top is connected by a linkage. That's the throttle linkage right there. We have what we call a front end throttle. And it's connected through a linkage that would normally be installed from this point back to the locomotive engineer on his side of the cab. So the superheated steam comes through the throttle body, through the pipes, and into here where the steam is then converted into mechanical energy, okay? reciprocating mechanical energy. The superheated steam then passes through the throttle controlled by the locomotive engineer and down through this delivery pipe into the cylinder. As the steam pushes on the cylinder, it pushes not only this device, but also the rod, the main rod, back to what we call the main driver and it's connected through this large pin. And all of this machinery spins around with the wheel. This rod is for reversing. It, it carries mechanical motion up to this device, which pivots like this. And this is connected then to the, to the valve. This is how we change direction on the steam locomotive. This can be moved independently of the wheels. This rod, this linkage, moves either forward or backward, and it raises this rod up and down, and it changes the position of the valve. When the steam pushes on the cylinder, it pushes this linkage, and all this mechanical motion comes back and rides back and forth on this slide. Back and forth, back and forth. And it takes four chuffs, if you will, out of the stack to complete one rotation of the wheels. So that chuff, 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 chuff. That means that the wheel has turned once around. 
and the faster the wheel is turning, the closer the chuffs are together coming out of the stack. And the faster this piece is moving back and forth, back and forth. As a steam locomotive accelerates, it begins to develop horsepower as the stroke of the valves is shortened, which means that depending upon the speed, you would work into a horsepower curve. And with the top of the 700s horsepower curve is probably about 5,000 horsepower. The sand dome is one of the domes that you'll see set on top of the, the boiler, the round part of a steam locomotive. And the, the purpose of the sand dome is to store sand, much like sand you'd find at the beach or on the, at the, by the riverbed. Um, and the sand is used to help provide traction to the locomotive to pull a train. Um, in flat territory, they don't have necessarily have to use a lot of sand, except maybe when the train is trying to accelerate. In mountainous territories, they'll use a lot of sand. Um, and like I said, it helps with the improved adhesion of the uh, wheels on the rail to move the train up the hill. There are pipes that come down from alongside the boiler and put it right on the rail, right in front of the driving wheel. So if you can just follow the pipes, come right on down. Sometimes it's just gravity. On uh, some bigger, more modern engines, it has a little bit of an air assist. If a track happened to be greasy, it's not going to uh, adhere too well to greasy rail. Wet rail could do it. Um, steep rail. In other words, anything over 1% on a railroad is considered steep. So when a train is trying to pull uphill, uh, that's when you're, when you're more likely to need sand. I know uh, some engineers, and if they know they're going downhill and they've got to go back up that same hill, no matter what kind of locomotive they're, they're running, they'll sand going downhill. So it's already down when they come back up. Uh, but generally you don't want to, you don't use it for braking. Sand, it's good and it's bad. It's good that it helps provide traction to get the train moving. It's bad because it also increases train resistance. In other words, it makes it so the train doesn't roll as easy. If you think of the engine crews, uh, back in those days, you had the engineer, uh, which controlled the throttle. You, you had the fireman, which was controlling the uh, fuel source and, uh, and a lot of other uh, control items in the, in the cab. Uh, you had a, uh, a head-end brakeman who would go on the ground and do any switching moves or flagging crossings or, or uh, protecting the train from the front. And you had a uh, rear-end brakeman who typically was in the caboose uh, with the conductor who uh, organized the train and uh, managed the consist uh, and, uh, and he was sort of the boss of the trains. It took far fewer people to operate a diesel locomotive than a steam locomotive. You had to do maintenance on the locomotive, which meant you had to have a whole shop and operating facility to do that maintenance. For example, if you bought a locomotive in at the end of the run, you had to have someone clean the fire, particularly if you were a coal locomotive, which meant you had to have an ash pit. You had to take it into the roundhouse, lubricate all around, to inspect all around, build sometimes any replacement parts. And firing up a locomotive in itself is a two-day exercise if done properly. So if a locomotive would go into the roundhouse, it'd be several days sometimes before it came out. In addition, on a monthly basis, you had to shut the whole locomotive down and completely wash the boiler. So the end of steam came about um, when uh, there are a lot of uh, evaluations of diesel power. Uh, during be preceding World War II and during World War II, certain companies had the ability and resources to develop the technology and improve it and offer a solution that could be very attractive to the railroads. And the railroads at that time, before World War II, were in financial trouble and uh, uh, they were always looking for ways to improve the bottom line. And after World War II, uh, there, there was a trend toward uh, moving to diesel power. Diesel power had some advantages that steam didn't. First of all, 
uh, steam was more labor intensive, which is part of the cost, and also required extensive facilities to maintain uh, the locomotives. Uh, diesels were designed with more uh, standard parts, off-the-shelf parts, and essentially were modular designs. And you could uh, add horsepower to a train without having to add crews because you could link diesel lo locomotives together uh, because they uh, had multiple unit capability, which meant you could control several diesel engines from one. Uh, so that was the master uh, controlling the slaves. And if you didn't need the extra horsepower, you just reduced the number of units, as diesel locomotives are called. And uh, uh, that would give you the adequate amount of horsepower, but just with the same number of crews. Steam locomotives, if you needed to add horsepower, you had it Alpers, and all of those helpers had full crews on them. So in 1947, this engine, I think it was on coming down the Snake River, ran into a rock pile. And it threw the engine off the track and it slid down the bank to the river. It was a pretty big mess, it took them a long time to clean it up. They actually had to cut the boiler off the frame and take it out in two pieces to get the engine out. But the only indication that this engine was ever in that wreck is this dent that's on the bottom of this pilot right here. 